In yesterday's video, we explored the tragic origins of the Karajan overlords. Torn from their homes, forced to live among the clouds in these experimental flying machines. To keep order, they banded together and formed the Code, a system of law and moral conduct that governs all aspects of their lives. But that was a long time ago, like hundreds of years, during the birth of the Age of Chaos. And today we're going to explore what that race of refugees was able to grow into. Who are the Kerrigan overlords as we know them today? We're going to explore the faction as a whole, its motivations, the sky fleets, and really seek to explore what kind of people do those origins and survival instincts create. Well, there's really two things that govern this faction or this race. And that's science and technology as one and commerce as the other. So let's break those down. The most obvious thing about the faction of Kerrigan Overlords is their technology. The secret of Aethergold has given them the gift of flight and a slew of fascinating weapons. Technological achievements have a very unique place in the minds of the Cajun Overlords. During the Age of Chaos, it was their savior. The then largely experimental airships literally delivered them from harm, and continue advancements on that design allows their race to flourish and continue. When you factor in things like improvements in engine efficiency and things like that as, as technology evolves and advances, this means that the race can expand and flourish. And the importance of these ships and the need for them doesn't just stop at immediate danger because it's also a vital piece of their continued existence. Smaller ships are designed at their core to gather ether gold, the most important resource the faction has. Research and development in ether gold technologies make life happen. You get bigger cities, more ships, higher populations. This dependency and respect for the sciences has more effects because you also get efficient weapons and tough armor. But the most interesting one is the rejection of myths and legends. This is a faction where self-reliance has been deeply ingrained in them from their origins. Grugni didn't save them. They, and their technology, saved themselves. As such, they largely reject the old gods and myths, thinking it's just superstition, it's irrelevant, gods aren't going to come and save us. They believe the gods exist, but like, they have nothing to do with the carriage and overlords. There are a few minor stories and folklore or things like that across the race, but largely those are mostly for children. They place an emphasis on the practical. Their experience has shown them that the gods don't care. They play their own game. And it's a worldview that pits the act of inventing, of creating above history, religion, and personal glory. And so all these things are the perfect recipe for a faction that is relentless in their intellectual endeavors. Bigger, better, more efficient, and cheaper, strong machines. Those are the concepts that took a desperate race and made them into a powerhouse. When the rest of the realms were falling apart. So that's the technological and science side of things. But that breeds the second part here, which is commerce. One of the most important aspects of the code was formalizing how trade and commerce were to function. The idea was to protect mining rights, how selling happens, and this is incredibly important for a few reasons. Science and technology don't happen without monumental resources. Physical materials, ether gold, manpower, education, workspaces. You can already see kind of the market building itself here. You need ships to gather supplies, companies that buy them, then sell to investors, who then invest in engineers to make more technology. Other ships collect ether gold, which is of course the most vital ingredient. You need a large workforce that is able to kind of carry out the day-to-day -day operations and they all have to be paid and eat and live and more ships to be built where these experiments can be run. The basic idea being need breeds opportunity and this faction had a lot of needs in the beginning. So by quickly forming into companies all trying to meet each other's needs, a civilization formed, then an economy, with the code there to make sure that it never consumes itself or creates monopolies. Truthfully, it only took like an ounce of organization to make this whole thing work. Once you add on top of that, that luxury items were added into the economy once wealth became a thing. This concept of trade and merchant themes is really important. And it gets kind of gets us back to what Duarden were when they were dwarves back in the old world, this kind of 
tropes about them being greedy and out for self-gain and kind of grumpy misers, but they still retain their good and honorable qualities. This got kind of a reimagining of those ideas. But also, it is a mechanism for introducing them to the forces of order. Because isolation and seclusion had brought them this far, but it's the trade and commerce that's going to happen with other societies, other civilizations, that's going to take them to the next level. And so when they saw the gates of Azir open, opportunity presented itself. Because these forces of order are going to need supplies, travel, materials. And the carriage and overlord stepped in and filled a vital role at that point. The rapid advancement of order cities can really be tied to the carriage and overlord involvement. And as beneficial as they were to the kind of grand alliance of order, it wasn't without tension. Because centuries of commerce, trade, and exchange under the code has made them into a very legalistic culture. They will honor any deal they make, they're good characters, but they will of course exploit every single loophole, every miswording, anything they can do to get the better end of the deal. They are super shifty when you're doing trades with them. And it can make them seem manipulative and underhanded, but it comes from a history of needing to be shrewd and very exact. To them, the letter of the law trumps the spirit of the law. So even though as they're adding value to the forces of order, there's still a very distinct tension to it. Now we'll discuss in tomorrow's video about how the skyports kind of organize themselves, but I want to kind of introduce them to you because these are the main figures that we meet when we're talking about how carriage and overlords relate to the kind of grand alliance of order. And they also kind of give us a sense of how the race itself has evolved and split up and re-split up across the realms. So we're going to introduce the sky porch right now, starting with Barak Urbaz. And they are by far the most commercial of any sky fleet. They have a heavy emphasis on trade and transportation. Making deals with them is super treacherous because, as we're talking about exploiting loopholes, these guys do it to the next level. And part of what has grown them so well in terms of trade and commerce is that they have secured extremely profitable fishing rights when it comes to the code and, and kind of how those rights work. In addition to that, they also have their own network of realm gates they know about where they can easily get to their fishing zones back and trade and transport really without the other skyports knowing. So if you're looking for an emphasis on that commerce side and how they fit into the grander narrative of the setting, this is definitely the skyport for you. Next is Barak Mornar. And this sky fleet hails from the realm of shadows. And as their ships move, a darkness kind of clings to them. And you can really think of them to put them as the most piratey, if you will, of skyports. Because they're often labeled as pirates and privateers by the other ones. And they're really known for kind of their guile and their sneakiness in deals. And so much to the point where different amendments to the code have been made specifically because some crew from Barak Mornar was being deterred about some deal and they had to kind of revise the way the entire faction operates to kind of cut out the seedy under deals of these guys. Now their skyport is also a hub of illicit commerce. The kinds of items, supplies, and such that the other skyports just won't or do not deliver on. Kind of think of these guys, if you're in prison, there's always that one kind of stereotypical prisoner who can quote unquote get you things. That's pretty much what this entire skyport is and I absolutely love it. Next up is Barak Zilfin. And this is the home and kind of home base for all engineers and ace pilots. Few fleets can match the technological prowess of Barak Zilfin. Put simply, they have two things going for them. The best pilots in the skies, able to survive longer and go further from the port than any others, and a top-notch engineering school. They turn out more ships and newer designs faster than anyone else. So if you want to lean into the science and technology of things, Zilfin is a great way to go. Then there's Barrack Thring, I believe that's how you pronounce that. And this is basically the skyport of grumpy old men. These are carriage and overlords that still revere and cling to the old ways. Some of them still venerate the old gods. They hate seeing amendments and changes being made to the code because really they just fundamentally believe that things change too much and that the original structure that we had before was the best means of survival. Now they don't necessarily want to go back to the ground per se, but just don't like the way that the race as a whole is evolving. It's too rapid for them. And that really kind of is their unique 
outlook on, and, and this separates them from other skyboards. Next up is Barak Zon, and this is the oldest of these skyports. It's often called the City of the Sun, because when light reflects off of it, it glows super hot red. And the Carriage and Overlord here focus on uh, martial prowess and really revere military exploits. They decorate the skyport with memorials of great battles they've won, big trophies, all that kind of stuff. Statues, memorials, all kind of displaying like not only did we survive the Age of Chaos, but we're triumphing in kind of that self-revelry. And the last one is Barak Nar. And this is the most successful of all skyports. Because they are highly practical and not superstitious at all. They invest heavily in scientific research and development. They maybe don't have as big of an engineering school as others, but there's all kinds of sciences to invest in. And their innovations have really helped it accrue great wealth. Additionally, it's also a place that great leaders tend to come from. They're of high moral character, very pragmatic, intelligent, quick-witted. And really, they were one of the focal points of how Carriage Overlords got to be such a vital, important part of the Grand Alliance Order, because no other Skyfleet as, was as aggressive when it came to seeking trade with non-Carriage and Overlords. And those are the major sky ports. Now, there are smaller ones scattered across the realms, but these really are the, the big ones that we see in the book and that really characterize the faction. And as you can see, they have all kind of taken different aspects of the original survival instincts that we talked about. Some leaned into commerce about how can we meet each other's needs and be profitable about it. Others are science and technology. Some don't like the advancement at all. Some of them are kind of underhanded and sneaky. You get the sense that this kind of, you can see how all of these different worldviews and developments can all spawn from the same point. That same origin story we talked about yesterday can all reasonably make these different skyports. And I really do appreciate about the lore. So friends, those are the facts about the Carriage and Overlords today. What they are currently like, kind of their main worldviews as far as technology engineering and the commerce side of things and how those are played out across the major skyports. We're going to explore this structure a little bit more and start diving into the units in tomorrow's video when we talk about the officers in charge. And if you like this video, please go ahead and share it with a friend if you or they are interested in Carriage and Overlords. It would mean so much to me. And if you enjoy the channel at all, go ahead and give me a like and subscribe. It would mean the world. Either way, I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's video. Thank you so much for watching and happy wargaming.